I'll assume everybody can see things pretty well here. Um, as uh, Haley and Eric said, we're presenting around design challenge learning today. And Allison and I are from the Tech Interactive in San Jose, California. Glad to be here and be partners with World Learning. Um, I'll introduce myself and then Allison can introduce herself. Um, so I'm the Senior Director of the Bowers Institute at the Tech Interactive, which is the branch of the tech that focuses on developing resources for educators um, in school, out of school time, uh, based on our exhibits and programs, et cetera. Allison? Um, and I'm Allison uh, Bolt. I am the program manager at the Bowers Institute, um, which is our sort of our education branch of the Tech Interactive. And um, as Eric had mentioned before, I work on partnerships like with here with World Learning, um, both uh, local and statewide partnerships, and then also um, the development of some of the resources that you guys have seen in the toolkit. So I'll just be hanging out sort of in the back room, background today and helping Erica answer some any questions that you guys might have. Yeah, and during the whole presentation, feel free to throw questions into chat. And as Allison said, she'll, she might address some or uh, bring them to my attention as well. So, um, all right, our session goals for today are to discuss some of the core principles of design challenge learning. We're actually gonna do a short design challenge. Uh, we wanna discuss some strategies to help um, learners build perseverance and collaboration, as well as building community, which is an important thing always, but especially during, um, a global pandemic that's a, a helpful thing for folks um, and how to address that during distance or in-person learning um, and then reflecting on how we can apply these strategies within each of our own settings so um, the tech interactive is a science center in san Jose, california this is a picture of it um, it's a beautiful building <laughs> Uh, and again, from our exhibits and programs there, we uh, develop resources for educators and we're able to test um, and evaluate and research on programs as well. Um, an interesting thing is that we have an annual tech challenge, design challenge meant for fourth through 12th graders. So around age nine through um, 18. And that challenge actually predated um, our building. So the tech challenge is a program come up by that's developed by engineers and educators working together um, and that foundational program and philosophy is really something that's now permeated all of our programs and you can see some uh, photos from our exhibit space um, from classrooms and from out of school time settings uh, where students are building and designing and iterating so a design challenge um, is a Re uses real world problems in order to engage learners in an iterative design process. And you can see off to the side that we have our own graphic um, describing this process. And a couple of key features is that um, one is that it's it's circular, right? So there's no no steps, no start here and then do this and this. But rather there's this idea of um, you can start in a lot of different places and many of these steps overlap. So in the center, we have imagine, create and test and reflect. So the students are actively brainstorming and building, um, developing solutions and then testing and reflecting on that and then imagining creating all, all that cycle again. The next layer is defining their problem and sharing their solution. And those are more metacognitive layers where students are really reflecting upon um, what they're doing, thinking about their process, um, and um, those pieces, again, can happen in parallel with what's happening in the inside circle. The outside, outermost circle is the innovator mindsets. So these are the key mindsets that we feel that students develop during this process and that we're trying to foster as they go through design challenges. So some key features of design challenges. I think a lot of us have done hands-on activities before. Many of the educators we work with have done this to varying degrees, but some key features that we found are really fundamental to developing those skills and mindsets are that the design challenge is actually solvable by multiple solutions, that there's opportunity for iteration so the students can actually test and improve their designs, that they connect with participant interests, and that we, during this, as educators, we make explicit connections to real world problems and careers. Um, a goal for students and a way that we think about our programming is actually 
um, around this sense of um, this idea of STEM identity. So it's really the degree to which a person integrates STEM into their sense of self. And there's a continuum, right, from low uh, negative, so being disinterested or having an actual phobia or avoidance of STEM subjects to um, a, a high affinity, right, a high sense of STEM identity where they really are interested, excited. And our goal for engaging learners and the aim we have is really to include and design activities for those who do not have a, yet have a strong STEM identity. So we're trying to move students from lower on this continuum to a higher position. And many of the strategies that we talk about and that you'll see in evidence as we go through the design challenge are actually um, with that idea of if you aim it at the students who have the most disinterest, avoidance or phobia or lower sense of STEM identity, you're actually including everyone. So it's a way to design these activities for inclusion um, for students who, again, don't yet have a strong sense of STEM identity and then building that. The skills we're building in the students as we're going through this process are, are many, right? So during this, we've, we've talked about, um, you know, with Imagine, you have students working on brainstorming ideas, they're building prototypes or mapping out parts of a system solution. They're analyzing um, their design performance and testing it to identify failure points, um, asking questions to develop criteria for success, um, figuring out what the needs of a user are as they're defining a problem. And then in sharing solutions, they're describing their process to an audience, right? And thinking about um, and addressing success and failure, their process and their next steps. So these are really some of the key skills we're trying to build in students as they go through design challenges. And then these mindsets, right? So just some ideas here of what evidence we're looking for with these mindsets. Um, so asking questions, wondering about possibilities, um, that when they're perseverant, they're seeking feedback, recognizing failure as part of a learning process and persevering through it. Um, when they're empathetic, they're using active listening strategies and considering the needs of other, others, being a good collaborator, ensuring that every other team member contributes. And as they're being bold, really taking risks to share new ideas and try new methods. So as I mentioned before, um, another key piece that's um, come into play, we've always thought is important, but has been especially important to the educators we work with in this past year, is um, how to use design challenges in order to build community. So I just wanted to provide a couple of examples here for how that can happen. Um, so one way is building for a common goal. So having, you know, uh, having all the students design a playground or design, design a playground for a class pet, um, having each team design a product for another team. So um, looking at what might be the needs and interests of, of other folks within their class classroom community. They can design for a broader community need. So say a community garden or a COVID safe food delivery system for neighbors. And then sharing solutions more broadly with the, with the school, other teachers, parents, other members of the community can really help them to um, take stock of and, and be, feel that their ideas are valued. And then again, coming back to these mindsets as we're thinking about community building, how do these play a role in the tone that you're setting within your classroom? And again, how can that be critically important, especially for those students who have a lower sense of STEM identity? How can it really be, again, a safe space for risk taking where you're encouraging them to be bold and curious? How can it be a place where they're giving each other and expecting to both give and receive constructive feedback um, as part of what helps them be perseverant and supporting each other and themselves in the design process? Um, how can they use empath they use uh, active listening strategies and think about the needs of others in order to build empathy? And then with collaboration, again, having making sure that every team member is contributing to the design and contributing to the share out and is really valued within that process. So these are all ways to support that community building within a design challenge. 
So um, we are going to do a design challenge in just a moment, which is the most exciting and interesting part. Um, uh, we're going to have time later on for questions, definitely, but I wanted to just pause for a moment and give folks a time, a chance to put some ideas or thoughts into chat if you have any at this time. So maybe anything that's resonated with you so far or has stood out as an area that you want a little bit more clarity. Reflection time is important, so I'll give you another second to think of a question, digest. You can start putting it in chat. So the sense of STEM identity being one that resonates, yeah. It's a really great framing. Um, I've worked in science centers um, since around 2000, and I've been at the tech for the last four years. And that idea is something that really appealed to me. Um, it really brought together a lot of different strands of thinking and pedagogy that I'd learned into a place where you can really think about and, and identify that as, as your touch point, right, for design. Yeah. So dealing with students who have decided that they're not techie. Um, an example of a design challenge that we do that is definitely not very techie <laughs> is um, one of my favorites, the wind-powered cupcake delivery device. Um, and so it sounds very sort of silly. It sounds um, very uh, whimsical. Um, and that kind of framing is actually a way to engage students who might, again, have an aversion to STEM. So they don't really think of it as a STEM design challenge. Um, but then once they engage in it, they really see that they're good at problem solving, that the skills they have in other areas apply, and that there's a lot of creativity in design challenges. And that can help them engage then in the next layer of, well, what if I had sensors on my <laughs> on my wind powered cupcake delivery device and what if i you know so they start wanting and being interested in some of those more technical aspects okay um so yeah and then the circular graphic that's a great point too so it's a never ending process which is both fun for students and also sometimes intimidating. <laughs> like, we're still working on this. You want me to iterate again? I thought I was done. Um, and it also helps to put it in the learner's hands, right? Of, are, are you done? I don't know. Is it achieving the goals you want? Does it work how you want it to work? What if you um, didn't have any wheels on your cupcake delivery device? What if you change some of these other pieces? All right, so um, I'm going to move on now. Feel free to still throw some stuff into chat. Um, but I wanted to uh, move on to talk about sort of prepping for a design challenge. Then again, we're actually going to do a design challenge all together here. Um, and uh, the parts that we really think about in a design challenge are, um, and then I'm going to cover in a second, are the materials and introducing the challenge. And then the actual prototyping, right? So imagining, creating, and testing and reflecting all together uh, make up prototyping. Um, and then the sharing solutions piece. So I hope everyone's awake and ready to go. Uh, before we get you all started on the design challenge, I wanted to cover a few key points about materials. Um, so one is that we really, um, we really want to choose materials that promote iteration. So in order to do that, we use a variety of materials. And again, this hits on the STEM identity piece as well. So some familiar everyday objects, things that are very common and recycled. You can see yogurt containers in here, french fry containers, um, corks, straws. Um, we want to use some items that are new to the learners as well, some novel and interesting items. And then some whimsical stuff. So using things that are brightly colored, have some, some twist ties, some metal ties here that are shiny. Um, and those, again, help to engage students, get them just excited and get them thinking about creating. And that's, again, for any age group. 
um, not just younger students, but, but even adults as well. And then you do want those science and building tools, right? You want to have some things that are, um, again, bridging into STEM um, or help them to bring some of those STEM content pieces back into, um, back into their design. And then another one is that we really like to organize and choose materials and divide them into categories. So this helps learners really focus on function and think more flexibly about the materials. We never have a kit that is like, this part is the wheels, this part is the axle, this part is the body of the car. We always have groups of, of items that can be used in a lot of different ways. So here's structural items. This might be wooden dowels, it might be straws, it might be chopsticks, right? Those all can be used to give your, your, your creation some structure. And then there's round things, right? So we might have bottle caps um, or, um, or CDs, uh, if anyone has those lying around still. Um, so other round items that might have a function within the design, maybe items with lots of surface area, um, and then different fasteners and connectors. So we tend not to use tape and glue because not having tape and glue helps to facilitate a couple of things. One is the reusability of materials. And the second is um, it promotes rapid prototyping and iteration. So being able to use rubber bands, um, binder clips, string, um, twist ties or pieces of metal, metal wire, um, those all help for the students to, again, think flexibly about materials and how they're connecting things, um, as well as making it so it's reusable. So those are all really key features around, around materials that I wanted to bring up before we do our design challenge. And then when you're introducing a design challenge, you wanna have some sort of question or scenario or story to really engage the students. Um, with the stories, it can literally be like a book um, or based off of a book um, that can connect you know, young students with a storybook they're reading and really inspire them um, or older students um, connecting to literature or history um, as an inspiration and jumping off point. Uh, short videos are great and we have a few of those within our um, lessons and resources. So we'll throw um, a link to those in chat. And you can check those out after the webinar today. And then even sometimes just a question again, can you design a wind powered cupcake delivery device? That could be enough of your story. So um, as we're going through this today, you can think about how you would inspire and engage your students and your learners. Okay. So here's our design challenge. Um, our design challenge is going to be engineering for earthquakes and desk shakes. Um, for this challenge, we're going to only use paper, um, but your task is to build a desktop paper fort for a future class pet. So we want a stable structure that your animal friend can hide in, feel safe, um, it can be um, any, you can design for any animal that you choose. And um, there are some criteria. So it needs to stand for three shakes. Um, it needs to include a way for the pet to be off of the surface of the desk. Um, so maybe that's a roof deck, maybe that's a second level, maybe that's a watchtower for your lizard over here. Um, and then the constraints. We're going to take about 10 minutes to build and test. You can use as much paper as you want. Um, I would recommend though using just a tiny bit of tape if you need to. Um, extra points if you use no tape at all. And your base should be about six inches by six inches or 15 centimeters um, is how big your base should be. So you can estimate that. That's okay. We won't make you get out the science rulers today. So um, I would like everybody to build today. I might stop sharing so we can see each other, but I'm um, going to give folks a chance to grab paper. You can grab anything you have on hand nearby. If you have some thicker paper from um, boxes from, from food, you can do that. If you have an old magazine or some notebook paper, or even if you have a bunch of post-it notes, you can grab those. Um, I'll put these prototyping questions up in a second, um, but we can think about these questions that we would actually ask during prototyping of 
of each other, of, of the learners um, doing our programs. Um, so what does your pet need from the structure and how are you addressing those needs? Um, having, we'll have each other share tricks that we've discovered as we're building, uh, maybe ways, different ways to connect our paper together. Um, and then as we're building too, sharing what challenges we have um, and how we might solve them. So feel free to speak up or share that. And um, what suggestions you might have for others. So what challenge are you running into and how did you solve it? Or what challenges running into and what suggestions do you need or do you want from others? So this is the fun part. I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment so we can all see each other. Um, so I'm gonna ask that people grab some paper. Um, we're gonna take 10 minutes to build and then I'll also have a few folks share out. Um, and if you can turn on your camera, um, if you feel comfortable with that, that would be great. You can also describe what you're doing in chat, um, but I'm gonna turn my camera down a little bit. You can see my Legos in the background. I promise I won't cheat and use Legos. Um, and you can grab a few pieces of paper. I'm gonna get Haley and Eric to do this as well. <laughs> Since I can see you and you're on camera. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, feel free to unmute if you want to talk about what you're doing, you want to kind of show the technique. Um, and if no one else is talking, then I will. <laughs> See a couple people getting bold with their cameras on. I think I'm going to design for a bird today because Although a bird can fly away if there's a structural, if there's an earthquake or a desk shake. I have lots of birds outside my window here. I'm only slightly mad that they ate all my cherries this year. Does anyone else want to describe who they're building for? I ran into a problem. I wanted to make a paper dowel, but I think I actually can't use tape because I don't have any in the room up here. Anyone have any suggestions? My paper dowel. Even if you're building off camera now, if you want to throw into chat some of the ideas you have about your design, feel free. I always like to, during sessions where we're talking about design challenges, actually have folks do one. A, it's more fun than just sitting and listening and B, it helps to demonstrate some of the principles and have you experience some of those mindsets. We have a question from Marbella, if we could please see the task again. Oh, yes, you may. I will share my screen again. Probably a good time for this anyway. Well, Justin, at least that they are being creative, even though they have taken up all of your art supplies in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I have no children at my house and I have an aggressive amount of art supplies. <laughs> Yeah, when my daughter wanted to was old enough to start using my stuff, I was like, wait, my colored pencils are all organized. I didn't realize I was that person. <laughs> so uh, our task is to build um, a shelter for our animal, our class pet. It needs to stand up to some desk shaking, um, have a way to stand um, for the animal to rest 
off of the surface of the desk. And you can use as much paper as you want, a tiny bit of tape. And we're, we have about five minutes here. Sounds like someone's doing something interesting with paper there. Anyone have a good technique that they discovered for connecting paper? I'm rolling it up and putting one inside the other. Oh, cool. Are you doing that in order to make it taller or just to give it some structure? You know, I don't know. I have no plan. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. But it's I find together. So. <laughs> I find folding the paper and then, you know, kind of putting it into kind of letting the folds hold the other sides of the paper helps like almost like origami because mm -hmm. I, I kind of built a little box. <laughs> nice. Do you want to show that again, Deepa? People sure. can find you and see. Cool. So I wanted to point out something interesting from what Haley said that um, she's like, I don't know what I'm doing, I do, <laughs> but I'm, I'm sort of organically seeing how these things all fit together. And I, that's an important piece for me. Um, I think part of our, our circular graphic and description of the process, I don't have students draw a design first necessarily, or even brainstorm. Um, oftentimes, especially when students are first getting started on this process, I find that design challenges like what we're doing now are actually really helpful in engaging them and making them um, feel like it's a safe environment for them to iterate. Um, I don't have good drafting skills. Um, so if I try and draw something and then try and make it out of paper or, or three-dimensional materials, it's not necessarily going to translate well. And I think especially for um, students who are new to design learning, uh, just doing design challenges and building, um, and younger students especially, that it, it can sometimes hinder the process for them to have to draw or have to brainstorm before they actually start working with the materials, especially when the materials have interesting properties. So by doing this um, and having them just jump in and right away build with the paper and explore and try out different things, you can see that there's, we have a box technique from, from Deepa, Haley's um, folding and rolling up her papers and seeing how they make a structure. That's awesome, Haley, people can check out Haley's design. I'm gonna scroll through. Um, if, if some other folks want to hold up their designs, Luis Morales, do you want to hold up what you're working on so far? Cool. I see. I have the idea in my head, but yeah, that's that's so great. I have the idea, but it's not ready yet. So, <laughs> so I'm I'm forcing you to share though before it's done for a reason, so we can see it in process. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so that we know that what it can look like along the way, right? So it looks like you have a tab, you've cut and folded a tab there. Is that to hold up the design or for something to fold into? Yes, it's, uh, I, <clears throat> I think it's going to look like a door for mm -hmm. the, for the pet to, to walk in and out. I love it. <laughs> I have, so I started with, um, a base that then I ended up folding. And then the sort of, I made a loop out of some paper for mine. And then a platform to go on top of the loop, just randomly folding my paper. I'm gonna test mine now, even though the build time is not over. I'm gonna test mine and shake it. I guess I could cheat and just shake my computer. <laughs> no one would ever know since we're remote. Mindset, yeah, it held up, at least in the direction I was shaking. Hmm. Maybe I'm building for a bird and something that needs to crawl. Yeah, Justin, to your point that prototyping is sometimes a lot quicker and quicker to be productive than trying to draw and then design. It's also nice because it, I think when you draw something and you design it, you get really attached to that idea and then forcing that thing to happen uh, versus being open to 
changing your design and making it different. Erica, can we see what Haley did? She actually put a little ducky on hers and it's sitting. <laughs> oh, Haley, you designed for your, your duck friend. Yeah, he's got a little chair now. Um, it kind of oh. holds up. <laughs> it holds up from our perspective. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So Haley, what would you, what are you going to do next? What are you going to change to make this, make your design work a little bit better for? I think I'm going to build him a slide so he can get into his pond. Oh, lovely. And so he has an emergency exit when it crumbles. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You're thinking ahead about safety. <laughs> I just made some stairs for mine. A little platform and some stairs. I have I don't have an animal friend up here. This is too small for my dog, but I'm putting some weight on top and I'm pretty sure it's gonna fall over. Yep. My balloon weight was too much. So I'll have to reinforce this somehow. All right, we're gonna take another 30 seconds to build. So if you haven't tested yet, Eric, I also saw that you had something you were working on uh, before. Something similar, I don't know something, a prototype. Perfect. <laughs> Just a prototype. <laughs> I have a, a paper clips, I couldn't find them, so I had to use tape, uh, you know, for the purpose of reusability. Okay. Just like a box for a, a prototype for, a, I don't know, a bed for a cat or something, uh, some miniature cat from the 26th <laughs> century that I would like to sit with me here. Yeah. <laughs> Your miniature psychic cat from yeah. <laughs> the 21st century. <laughs> All right. I see Justin's got something. Okay. I am going to um, stop my timer. I'm going to stop sharing here my screen. Um, so we can all see each other. Um, if you had your your camera off while you were building, but you wanna uh, you wanna um, share now, please feel free. I see we have Luis. Um, I saw Indra earlier was on here as well. Camera on. If you wanna turn your camera back on, I'd love to see the design you have. <laughs> Great. So um, are are there a few folks? Oh, lovely. Marbella, I love it. It looks like you use some some cardboard. Okay, I'm gonna have a few people share their designs. Um, so this is the way it's gonna go, um, and we have enough time for a few people to to share. Ooh, I love love everybody's designs coming on camera here, being able to see. So first, let's do a silent a silent tour of of people's designs. So everybody who's got their camera on, make sure your design is in view, and you can kind of turn it and show the parts. People can get an idea of what you made, what you did. So our silent gallery walk here, except for me, I get to talk. <laughs> oh, I love it. All different ways that we folded the paper and gave it some structure and dimension. Lovely. Roj, I love your, your design there. Michael, that's looking great. Marbella, <laughs> lovely. Display platform. From a very small chimera, I like how you tried, <laughs> tried again, and then came up with something that works. That's great. <laughs> so um, I'm going to have a few people now share out uh, verbally if you're up for it and let us know about your design. So I want to know wow. sort of who you designed for. Oh, that one has a tunnel. OK, um, Lorena, I might have you go first. <laughs> you just caught my eye. So uh, if you can share what pet you were designing for. Um, some of the features of your design, and then um, maybe some of the things that you ran into along the way, something about your process and how you how you change things or, or did things differently. So, Lorena, do you want to go ahead, go first? Yes, of course. Well, I was trying to design a tunnel for my cat, but actually I found this um, toilet roll paper here. And I think that might be now for a cat. Uh, for a mice, sorry, for a mouse, something like that. But anyways, I I know my cat will find a way to to enter this uh, this tunnel. 
<laughs> yeah, cats always find a way, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, in his paper. I think it's his favorite, favorite I don't know, material in the world. <laughs> so uh, have you tested it yet? Did it stand up? To Not shake? yet. My cat is shake it? sleeping right now. Yeah. Right. Test its earthquake ability. Oh, it's got good give. It was three times. One, yeah. two, and three. <laughs> <laughs> and what what would you do next? What would you do next in your process? Maybe I think I need some structure here. Oh, oh it didn't work. See, <laughs> I just broke it. All right, so so I need to find a way to hold it. Great. To make it still like that. Excellent. So it needs to stand up to the cat going or yeah. the mouse going in and out and not fall on their head. Lovely. Let's give. Lorena Hand, lovely job. <laughs> um, is there someone else who wants to share about their design? Right, I'll choose, I'll choose somebody. Yeah, Mar Marbella, do you want to go ahead? Sure. <laughs> so um, I found an old calendar that I had a uh, laying around that was from last year. I actually stole um, Eric's idea with the paper clips. Um, I know that that wasn't part of the, the material, but I did have some, I didn't have any tape and I did have paper clips. So, um, I just took it apart and uh, the calendar, I took it apart and then I, I made these little, a uh, fold. So initially, like I had only, um, folded it in half, but then I noticed that I did need like a, like a three part structure. So mm -hmm. uh, I folded it into three and it's held together and, and I did shake it and it does hold up. So that. I guess it was successful in that sense. <laughs> Excellent. And what kind of animal, who did you design for? So I was thinking of my cat as well. Um, obviously, this is just a, a prototype. It, he wouldn't, he wouldn't fit under this. <laughs> and he might destroy it too. So <laughs> I'd have to make it a little sturdier uh, so that it would actually um, hold up to his, his abuse. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, I like the techniques you used and that you discovered you needed to fold multiple times in order to get good good structure on those on those legs. So what would your next step be? Um I think I'm as I said, I might make it larger in order to make sure that the cat would fit in and um find something to replace these paper clips because they're not very sturdy. So they could they could fall pop out of place or something. That's great. That's great. Um Michael or Luis, do you want to share? Michael, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, oh, yeah. Sorry, let's give a let's give a Marbella a hand. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. No, Michael, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so, so basically, I think it's a very similar idea to to Eric's as well. It's just kind of a containing box. I was thinking about something like a pet lizard. I don't have any pets, but I was thinking maybe a pet lizard, and and I kept thinking about. Not so, I mean, I was thinking about a, a very drastic situation where the containment system would just fall off. And so I wanted to have some structure that would kind of bounce back, you know, against any impact. So the, the little lizard would just be okay and escape when he was ready to escape. So it has two parts. It has like a, a containment uh, base and then it has like a little roof on top. Um, and I think it's really important to think about the future is maybe having some sort of uh, maybe a little internal container for food and water, just in case. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of what I was exploring. That's great. I love that. I love that disaster scenario planning, Michael, for all, <laughs> all conditions for, <laughs> for the living. <laughs> that's great. That's Thank great. You. And, Let's give Michael a hand. And then Luis, do you want to share where you got with your design and what you would do next? Sure. So just like Michael, I don't have pets. So I was thinking about either a turtle or a hamster. It has a little door here. So I'm not sure they are going to close it, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So they will walk in, it has a roof. So there is, if you can see it from top, there is a space mm -hmm. for, for sun to come, to come in. And they can also have shelter from the sun if needed, right? Uh, I would add either stairs or a slide maybe, something that they 
can climb and uh, go on top of the of the shelter that I did. I use tape because I needed to for this. That's fine. Tape, is, tape, That's is, fine. tape is allowed. <laughs> <laughs> you just got extra points for no tape. That's great. That's great. So uh, we heard about what you did, what you would do next. I think that looks like it would stand up to an earthquake as well. It has a nice sort of boxy structure. So um, that's that's great. Let's give Louis, Louis a hand. Woohoo! Well done. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so uh, a couple of things I wanted to point out is that um, people really dove in, right? You used what you had around. Um, I think a big question all the time, but especially, um, you know, during this pandemic has been, do my students, do my learners have any materials to use at home in order to do these activities? And we saw that with no preparation, right? <laughs> when I was like, grab some stuff, what do you have around? You were able to find some materials to work with. And so I think that can be really inspirational, not just for the students, but for us as well, right? We can see what the students were able to find, what they had on hand, what they used. Um, and they can really feel empowered then to to, to do, um, you know, even a complex design with with materials that they have around. Um, and students who are used to using more, you know, fancy schmancy materials, and and um, uh, we'll also see how some simple things around their house are are very useful and can be used for a lot of different purposes. Um, and then we also noticed that people were man were manipulating these things, right? Changing the form, changing the structure. And so, you know, thinking about sort of those three-dimensional, two-dimensional to three-dimensional transformational skills, um, and all of that is also something that we sort of saw at play today. So I'm gonna share our slides and go through a few more um, kind of things. All right. So we did share out, um, we did this already, but we talked about our, our pets needs. Um, we talked about ideas that we borrowed from other folks um, and gave them credit and that's definitely okay, right? No ideas came out of nowhere. Like all of our ideas are influenced by things we've seen and done and heard. Um, so adding that to the collaboration instead of this is my thing and I came up with it and no one else knows um, that you're always building off of other people's ideas and that's a great way to build a community. Um, so um, I wanna have you reflect a little bit as a participant, um, what sort of what it, part of the experience stood out for you? Um, how did it feel to use the design process? And then which parts of that process felt a little bit more empowering and which parts felt more challenging for you? Um, and then in thinking about setting the tone for our learners and bridging to that, what really helped you connect with the other participants during the activity today? So I'm gonna give you just a minute to reflect. Um, you can jot down ideas if that's what you like to do in a notebook or on a piece of paper for yourself. Um, you can also feel free to share in chat and I welcome folks additionally to go ahead and unmute yourself and you can address one of these questions if you'd like. <clears throat> Oops, I went ahead on my slides. Here we go. So feel free to jot down on paper again or throw it in chat. Great. So Indra said that he, what stood out was, um, and it sounds like what's, what felt empowering for you as well, Indra, is, was the imagination when you had limited resources and materials, what you were able to do. That's great. What else? What are some of the other things that stood out for folks as either empowering or potentially challenging or off-putting even? Yeah. So Michael, the time resource constraint was challenging. Did it feel, at the end, did it feel successful or did it still feel kind of like, ooh? Well, I think it, it, it felt successful because you helped us feel like we were accomplishing something. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there might be different scenarios where if you don't comply with those constraints or you don't uh, comply with the limitations, um, you might not receive positive feedback uh, always. 
Yeah, and I think that's an important point, right? Um, we all built different things. Um, some people use tape, and when people mention that, I encourage you again, that's that's okay, that was within the rules. Um, I don't know, I didn't really notice if everybody had a place for their animal to rest off the ground. So the criterion constraints can be something that you really are a stickler for, or again, it can be that jumping off point for building and, and creating. So it's part of part of that um, kind of the environment you're creating. I see that Monica was saying that not having a sample was challenging, um, but she understood that that was part of the challenge of this activity. I also wanted to point out the short amount of time we had was important for us not to build something and be final. Like this is the beautiful bridge I built and it's painted and it's perfect. And now I'm gonna test it and now it broke, <laughs> right? Um, so when we do these rapid build and prototyping um, sessions, that's a way for uh, folks to really engage, um, see that focus on the process. Um, we have paper prototypes that we made, that was great. Now we can do a longer challenge, right? Where we either refine this a little bit more build a life-size model for our animals um, or have this you know um, inform what we're doing for another kind of structural challenge um, but it's a nice way to practice that right let's test let's test early let's test often let's change our design let's evolve them instead of building the final thing that we're so invested in and then having it break or not work right so that's why the time pressure sometimes is hard for students at first because they're also expecting to give you a perfect product right so now shifting gears and thinking about facilitation. Um, as a facilitator, I want you to think about how you would support learners to really develop a deeper connection with this innovation design process and um, the innovator mindsets that we, that we brought up earlier. And then what might you add in order to layer in more opportunities for community building um, or even to connect to your students' interests? How would you customize even this particular challenge for your learning setting. Again, feel free to jot down a few ideas and reflections for yourself. And then throw things into chat. And just looking back at what people said earlier in chat also things feeling challenging at the beginning and then feeling better later right? it being an open process and so being able to see irene mentioned being able to see lots of different ways that people addressed and answered it and then monica i just wanted to address again with not having a sample um, that in some ways you did after a while, right? Once you started seeing other other participants build. And so I think that that's sort of an interesting um, aspect as well of having the students really, um, you know, we're coming up with something new and maybe there aren't ideas that we have. If you have a student though who approaches you and is really stressed about that and, and concerned that you can have them again take a tour around the class and sort of see what other folks are, are working on and building or um, think about, other structures they know about, you know, like bridges and et cetera, that they might be, um, that might, they might use as a reference point. And now it looks like folks have um, setting suggestions for what they would do. Maybe a quick brainstorming session um, before they start prototyping, that's a great idea. So even just sharing some quick ideas before they grab their materials. Um, setting up a scenario for why, right? So they're building and then having oh, yeah, them work in small groups. Um, and then building in teams. Yeah, Justin, we have, we've had folks do that by using um, breakout rooms in Zoom. So having them have some more time where they feel like they can talk and share instead of, you know, 20 people or 40 people on a screen. Um, so that kind of thing can work. And expanding the session. Great, where you have someone starting, 
um, and student B sort of building a prototype. It's great. Love the ideas. Feel free to throw more into chat. Um, I want to just review a couple of the strategies we used today in the last few minutes that we've got and hit on a, a few key things that, again, most uh, many of you have already thought of. Um, so one is that today with prototyping strategies, right, we used um, a strategy we used is synchronous build time where we were all building at the same time. You can also have students build, introduce the idea, have them start together, and then give them time overnight, over a few days in order to work on their designs as well. We used rapid build time, as I mentioned, as a way for us to focus on process, not worry about having a final product and get comfortable and kind of get um, build that kind of uh, environment where we are honoring process and not worried about um, what our final product is as much. And it also helps to foster um, some risk taking. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we shared tips and tricks along the way as we were actually building. So we were able to share in the moment um, what we were trying, what we were running into. And, and then I know many folks are still working in a virtual environment with some or all of their students. So um, having them build on camera like we did so they can learn from each other. And as we mentioned, using breakout rooms um, so that they can dialogue. And I think a lot of us have noticed too um, how much the students like to use chat and they can chat and build. <laughs> Um, so typing in chat is also a great way for them to interact and encouraging that is really helpful. And then in sharing solutions, right, we focused on the needs of our animal user. Um, we were crediting ideas that were inspired by others and getting feedback. Um, so I think it's important for you to think about um, kind of what are some of the key strategies you want to use, focusing on process, on collaboration, or recognizing and and celebrating that, that everyone, even though we didn't have time, but that everyone would get a chance to share. Um, and it doesn't matter how far along in their process they are, right? So you're like, that's great. You thought of a way to do this and this, and you're really struggling with this idea. Fabulous. Um, you know, what would you do next? Always a question I ask. Um, and so thinking about how you would really celebrate and include everyone and how you're able to honor everyone's kind of experience and what, they, what they've done and what they've struggled with so far. So another key piece is really thinking about and um, having them reflect on mindsets. So um, I'm going to have you quickly do uh, in chat for yourself, um, which mindset did you really embody today? Which one did you feel like you were exercising and using the most? And then which one do you want to develop in yourself? Today, I would say I felt very collaborative that you're talking and sharing. So I felt very collaborative today. And maybe I want to work on being more curious next time. So again, you can jot down for yourself or you can throw into chat which mindset you were using or which one you want to work on. And as you're doing that, I want to talk about sort of the importance of doing this for students. And having self-reflection tools really helps them to clarify and define these mindsets, um, building their own awareness of their strengths um, and the strengths and needs of others is very important. Um, and that it can really be a formative sort of assessment that's in informally kind of completed um, by, by the students. And we see in chat that Justin feels very honest that he wasn't being very perseverant today. Um, so that could be something that we talked about as a group. Um, here you can see a reflection from an 11 year old, 12 year old student, very open ended that a strength that they felt like they had over the past few weeks of doing a design challenge was that being empathetic. Um, and she, they say because their ideas don't always work out um, the way they want them to, but we find a way to fix that. And then they wanted to improve. Um, I've noticed that I need to work on being bold because I'm really scared of taking a risk and that gets in the way of our engineering sometimes. So you can see just how really honest and um, reflective these students are and then what kind of difference that might make in not only their design and their work in that particular learning setting, but how that can bridge to other ones as well. I find it a very powerful tool and a nice way to focus on not just the academic portions, that might come into play with some of this or the STEM skills, um, but the other soft skills as well. 
really gives a common language for your group to talk about them. Okay, I have a couple more slides. Um, so thinking about just virtual settings, there's a lot of different ways to do it in a low tech, some tech and all tech kinds of ways. So I think for yourselves, thinking about being flexible about how you try and implement design challenges, um, they're very flexible in themselves, right? So thinking about how you can adjust them for your learners, your goals, as well as the amount of technology you might have if there's virtual settings. I'm thinking about, again, supporting families with information about materials and process and how to support student work if the students are doing these challenges from home. And then for yourself, um, as you're implementing design challenges, remind yourself that you're learning and iterating too. You're doing a design process. So being flexible, um, trying new things, uh, making sure you test and reflect, and then sharing within your educator community, sharing with friends, um, with folks you might meet on these, these webinar sessions, and really getting feedback and growing together um, and trying new things. So think about for yourself um, what you might try next, how you might adapt or adjust an activity to make it more open-ended, um, to make it more like a design challenge. Um, think about one thing you might want to foster in your students as you move forward in your learners and in your, your learning setting. So I don't know how much time we have for, for questions. <laughs> Um, but feel free to unmute and ask a couple of questions until Haley or Deepa stop us and have us move on. Um, I also wanted to share that in addition to the global um, STEM toolkit that we put together with uh, World Learning, we have a few other educator resources that hit on um, facilitation techniques, um, as well as some great guides we've developed this past year and videos for design challenges that are really helpful at, um, for students working at home. So we have those in English and many of those in Spanish as well. So Allison and I will drop these links into chat um, so that you can have easy access to those. Um, but I'm going to, oh, and if you want to be in touch with us, um, you can use one of these email addresses and reach out and let us know if you have any questions. But folks should also Feel free now if you have any last questions or comments to jump in here, or you can also put them in chat and I can address them as um, Deepa begins her session as well. We are not behind schedule, so please take as much time as you to answer questions. If anyone has one, either unmute or type it into the chat. And I do want to say I really appreciate um, everyone jumping in today and testing out their design challenges. Um, um, hello. Yeah, so I, I, I do have a question. So um, I'm not sure how much of importance it has to get into research and exploration. I know we have curious as one of those important values in the process, but should we devote any time to the process of exploring and researching um, before addressing a challenge or, or a problem? Yeah, um, so I like to provide a lot of different opportunities for that. Um, and depending on, and to vary where that comes in within the activities, right? So with a design challenge, we did a quick design challenge today and we did a lot of different things, but we didn't really brainstorm. We did more prototyping in the moment and sharing, right? Um, but what you could do with that is now that folks are a little bit more interested and engaged and have some ideas of some problems they want to solve, that you could have um, a little bit more of a research phase now or provide some of those those resources, right, where students are looking at um, maybe it's origami techniques or maybe it's real life, how bridges and buildings are constructed and things are put together. You could have them bring in samples from home of things that they might have built or someone else in their family might have built or photos, right? So you could you could bridge into that research part um, and that could get more and more technical depending on the setting, right? The students you have, um, the grade level that you're working with um, and their interests and, and abilities as well. I tend not to start with the research because they don't know what questions they have. <laughs> Um, and they're they're going to be you know much less engaged in it than if you provide that opportunity a little bit later on. 
Okay, so if I understand correctly, inspiring them and engaging them with the topic is more important than beginning with research or exploration. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I'm seeing a couple of things in chat here. Yeah. Yeah, that it's it was hard to and you got a little bit frustrated, I see because you you it was hard to build a box for your imaginary turtle um and I, and i think that that's that's a, an interesting um idea of you know again how are you persevering through that what might be easy for you is hard for somebody else and vice versa so as you're presenting and sharing activities with your students how can you provide them with different opportunities to engage and different types of activities and Michael, to your point as well, when and how are you pushing your students in different ways, right? So every time you do a design challenge, you can have a different focus or different goals. Um, so it could be on practicing brainstorming, and that could be an emphasis, and you have more time for that. Or it could be more on prototyping and testing, or on measuring results and looking at data, right? So there's different things you can emphasize, and by varying that, you also are hitting, um, again, on something that Gulnara mentioned of where um, a subtext of, of the comment of where there are things that are more difficult and easier. So you can, again, have students excel in something, have them try something new, have that be hard, have them persist, um, and have them share expertise and experience that of things that they're really good at. Um, and I'm, great, I'm excited that someone's going to use this activity this weekend. <laughs> Instantly useful. That's what we're going for. <laughs> Yeah, Irene, um, there is a lot of similarities between design challenges and project-based learning. Um, they're really a nice fit. Um, and that goes back to Michael's comment as well about around research. So design challenges have some key features, right, where we're talking about there's multiple solutions, it's open-ended, all of that. And that maps really well with project-based learning that you could see this activity, right, we did it in 20 minutes with our sharing and and some, you know, and our build time. But you could also see this becoming a month long project, like we talked about, of building a real life model, maybe um, working with an animal shelter in your area and seeing what those animals need or a zoo. Um, so you can see how it can just expand to become like a giant PBL unit. Well, there's no other questions. Um, thank you so much for your time. And I'll turn it on over to Deepa. And for her session. And again, feel free to reach out. Allison and I will throw our emails into chat as well.